Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our Blockchain at Butzel series, Blockchain Take the Wheel, Potential Applications for Blockchain in the Automotive Industry. During this afternoon's presentation, please feel free to submit questions to the presenters using the Zoom Q&A panel. Additionally, a copy and recording of this presentation will be made available this afternoon on our webinar event page on Butzel.com. So with that housekeeping out of the way, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and to introduce our presenters today, Butzel Long shareholders, William Krauss and Jennifer Dukarski. Mr. Krauss represents individuals and businesses involved in governmental and regulatory investigations, US state and federal litigation and alternative dispute resolution. He concentrates his practice on disputes relating to the financial industry with a particular focus on legal and regulatory issues related to digital assets and blockchain technology. Mr. Karski focuses our practice on the intersection of technology and communications with an emphasis on the legal issues arising from emerging and disruptive innovation, digital media and content, vehicle safety, connected and autonomous cars, shared mobility, infotainment, data privacy, and security. Thank you both for presenting today, Bill and Jen. Uh, with that, I will pass it off to Bill to begin the presentation. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, hello, and welcome back everyone to Blockchain at Butzel. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been rolling out a webinar series examining the law and regulation surrounding digital assets and blockchain. And I'd like to you know, second the welcome um, to our third webinar, Blockchain Take the Wheel. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, as you know, if you've been to one of these before, our webinars will be structured as introductory, intermediate, or advanced based on how general or specific the subject matter of that particular webinar is. And last week's webinar, From Orange Groves to Blockchain, Financial Regulation, Digital Assets, was an intermediary level webinar discussing the treatment of digital assets under the U.S. financial regulatory system. A recording of that presentation can be found on Butts Along's website as well as YouTube, as can our first webinar, an introductory session titled, Is Bitcoin Illegal? Also, What's Bitcoin? To that end, today's webinar is going to be structured as advanced and will presume but not require some basic knowledge regarding blockchain. Our goal for today will be to provide a basic introduction, perhaps refresher of that technology, with a really great in-depth discussion as to how this technology could impact the automotive industry. Um, as I've said before, future webinars will explore other legal issues in greater depth, and our next three webinars begin in May. We're excited what we have for store, in store for you, and I certainly hope that you can join us. Um, and I'm also very, very excited today to be joined here by Jennifer Dikarski. Um, beyond what's already been said about her background, I'd like to add that she really brings an absolute wealth of information and experience to our discussion today, um, and has really emerged as a thought leader in emerging technologies and the law around them. So combined with her encyclopedic knowledge of the automotive industry, I can't wait to dive in. Please to that end, if you have a question that you think would be you know, instructive or something to allow you to take a little bit more away from this webinar, please don't hesitate to pose it using that Q&A button. So with that, let's get started. Um, can we have the first slide, please? So for those of you who need a quick refresher or perhaps an introduction, I'm just gonna go over briefly blockchain technology at a very high level. Um, at this point, I presume that everyone in the audience has at least heard of Bitcoin and that everyone is aware of the impact it has had really over the last couple of years and how we think about traditional finance. Now, while Bitcoin is truly a revolutionary technology, not everyone is aware that Bitcoin really brought blockchain technology to the masses as well. Um, in my opinion, that contribution is arguably as significant, if not more so, than Bitcoin and digital assets. So let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin's blockchain as an example of the technology. It'll serve sort of a building block for us to discuss other applications. So in short, Bitcoin's blockchain is publicly available and it's a distributed ledger that provides a permanent record of every Bitcoin transaction. Each block constitutes a series of transaction records which builds in the block before it. And taken together, these blocks form a permanent chain showing the entire history of Bitcoin transactions. Now in this way, you can really just think of blockchain as blocks of information that are strung together. Now another key point to understand is, at least with Bitcoin, their blockchain relies on a series of miners who confirm the legitimacy of each transaction before it can be added to the blockchain by solving a complex puzzle. This decentralization aspect, or at the very least, this distributed ledger concept is key to discussing 
our blockchain going forward. Um, by design, this verification requires a significant amount of computing power. And the system of verification is generally referred to as proof of work because it requires proof, namely solving the puzzle, that someone has expanded significant computing resources to verify the transaction. Now, if you think about it, that verification requirement, the proof of work, actually helps ensure the integrity of Bitcoin's blockchain because it's meant to be costly from a time and energy perspective for any actor or actors to participate. And therefore, it makes it more difficult to overwhelm the system or to tamper or manipulate the blockchain. And that said, blockchain technology doesn't generally require proof of work. You can have any form of verification on a blockchain and we can see some other approaches being used in business applications. Um, moreover, by distributing a copy of the ledger to all these participants, you essentially have a consensus system whereby independent actors have to agree that something happened, um, namely a valid Bitcoin transaction for it to be added to the blockchain. This too helps ensure data integrity by making it very difficult to cheat the system. So let's step back and talk about general concepts really quickly as sort of a uh, launching pad for our discussion. Bitcoin's blockchain demonstrates certain core principles that we'll see in blockchain. First, it's a permanent digital record. Second, it relies on a distributed ledger, namely a repository of records shared by multiple entities um, that allows parties to transact without the use or need for a trusted intermediary. It is secured by encryption and is tamper resistant, and it stores a massive amount of information and creates a mathematically verified audit trail. Now, to be clear, once again, when Bitcoin's blockchain is public and decentralized, blockchains can just as readily be private and centralized, i.e. under the complete control of business. And indeed, businesses in many industries have explored and applied blockchain, and it's my opinion that this trend will only continue as more companies become more familiar with the technology. The potential benefits these businesses have found is simply staggering. Um, blockchain can provide, like I said, a perfect audit trail, resistant to tampering by any one actor. You can imagine the usefulness of that. Blockchain can efficiently track regular and frequent transactions without the need for manual data entry. They can be self-verifying. And blockchain can also facilitate extremely fast transactions, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, general background or refresher, let's pivot to the automotive industry and some of the potential applications here by turning it over to Jen. All right, so let's let's take a look at where blockchain is being applied right now and what that kind of market uh, looks like from a general perspective. Next slide, please. So really when you're looking at these types of applications, they're really falling into two basic groupings. One, I'm going to say it's a consumer oriented use case and the other is more of a business uh, or supply chain oriented use case. So when you think about how you interact with vehicles, with transportation, with any functional modality of mobility, there's a lot of opportunity for a blockchain application. Think about when you hop into a vehicle, and again, pre-COVID, but let's say you hopped into an Uber or you hopped into a Lyft and you're wanting to make a payment or you're using a taxi, some sort of a, a mobility service. Blockchain applications could potentially include in-vehicle payment, mobility as a service kind of ride sharing applications. Moreover, blockchains can be used to protect any of that personal information that, that is collected about you, whether it's the payment modality, any music preferences while you're in a vehicle that you might be renting or, or using or leasing. Um, and finally, you can even look into the app application of auto insurance pricing. Um, there's a, an insurance company in Ontario who's been heavily studying the application of um, taking a look at micro trips and the ability to charge users for short duration trips based on a lot of different factors, whether that's the weather at the time, the time of day that they're traveling, um, the actual path and trajectory their vehicle's going, which roads they choose, how bad those roads are from, from a condition standpoint. And they're able to dial in with that information all added up um, into, a, into a chain to find an actual pricing that is more applicable to true usage. And blockchain is one of the potential applications or use cases um, that they're looking at to try to actually market this particular product. Next slide, please. But equally interesting is the application from the standpoint of the supply chain. 
and really kind of in the B2B realm with a, a supplier sending to a customer in the automotive sector, there's a, a lot of opportunities and a lot of use cases. And we'll get into a few of these in a little more detail shortly. Um, but one of, the, one of the possible cases is um, looking at and monitoring for the intrusion or insertion of counterfeit goods. So traceability to a heavy level and, and preventing any counterfeit insertion. Um, managing safety defects, warranty issues, making sure that components are actually recalled, they're recalled with correct revision components that removes the defect. Um, payment and PO completion at each stage within the manufacturing process. This could be from a supplier to a customer or even internal to the facility itself from a, a um, raw material to a certain point in the transaction of manufacturing a component. You can use these types of exchanges for payment within, you know, within supplier divisions. Um, comprehensive protections for autonomous vehicles. When you look at how many, um, just the, the vast amounts of data that will be collected by autonomous vehicles, this is often thought to be an excellent way to potentially store that data, use that data to understand the true transaction and nature of that autonomous vehicle um, as we go through the design and development of technologies that are that those types of emerging techs. And, and finally, really um, fleet location and trend, uh, condition management situations, um, understanding where vehicles and fleets are and constructing a true chain of information that will allow for really truly better managing of, of fleet vehicle technologies. This is another major area that people are spending a lot of money in. But let's take a, a look in a little more detail. Next slide, please. So where are these companies at and where are the, the companies who are startups coming, you know, coming to the forefront? This is a heat map basically of automotive startups that are looking at blockchain. Um, as you can see, they're truly global. We have a, a few of them here in the US dotted throughout Europe. Um, but I mean, even in India, even in Australia, this is an area that's only growing. And this is as of January, 2019. Um, granted, what happened during COVID, whether there was a slowdown or a pickup um, in this type of technology, there, there hasn't been an updated heat map. But you can see, though, that really it, it is an interesting area, lots of growth. And I think when we go to the next slide, you'll see just how many different players are coming into the space. And this is an eye chart. I'm not going to read to you every single one of these. Um, but suffice it to say, when you start looking at what applications are out there, they're really targeting things that help the supply chain, that help the companies grow automotive uh, as, a, as a whole. Um, they, they will help reduce cost of vehicle maintenance. They can provide loyalty and reward networks, peer-to-peer um, -peer transportation networks, and fighting fraud in componentry and replacement parts. So lots of disclosed partnerships, lots of opportunities, lots of actual use cases going on. And let's take a look at a couple of those. So first use case, supply chain management. Now, when you think about supply chain management, I, I'm truly talking global from raw materials all the way through to a finished automobile and then even potentially the sale. Next slide, please. So a lot of supply challenges that we face today um, can, can come down to a few different areas. Traceability, the ability to find parts, the ability to store information and, and track a component part through its entire life cycle. Um, we deal with tons of errors in inventory data. We find missing shipments, duplicate payments, um, and coordinating between partners, whether that's financing, contracts, um, or even international transactions, sending goods and services around the globe. These are supply challenges that blockchain could potentially be fitted um, as a perfect um, technological advance to minimize some of these issues. Uh, blockchain can enhance traceability. As Bill mentioned, um, every step along the way, blockchains, you, you're able to, to collect a lot of data and it's going to stay relevant to a particular component part. So as you manufacture chips, as you manufacture ECUs, as you manufacture component parts that get tested, we can keep throughout the entire life cycle in that chain, all of the test data, all of the granular information, all the way through until the vehicle's final assembly and sale to an individual. That record being permanent again, as Bill mentioned, 
can follow that particular component around. And in time, if something happens where warranty or, or recall issues appear, that information will be there. You'll know who possesses that vehicle because of the, the, the immutability of the chain. And you're able to figure out whether components have been replaced, whether that vehicle needs to truly be serviced. Next slide, please. Jen, as a quick question. Um, you know, in terms of adding those data points, I think it'd be interesting for our audience to hear. I mean, how do you envision those being added? Is it, you know, somebody's going like in a, you know, a warehouse and, you know, scanning a barcode and that adds it to the blockchain? Could we see in a situation in which the vehicle itself had the blockchain, you know, sort of in its, you know, electronics and its computer chips? Well, that's a really good question, Bill. And I, I think when you look at manufacturing over the last 30 years, we've really seen a, a movement of increased and enhanced traceability and a lot of data collection throughout the, the, throughout the entire process, going from raw material through the transition into components. Um, for, um, for, for those of you who may not know, I have spent 15 years as an engineer uh, before becoming a lawyer. So I actually had hands-on in the production process. And I can tell you to manufacture components, there's a lot of tests, inspections and, and different safety points throughout the manufacturing. And when you get down to it, a lot of that data is being collected and perhaps stored on a computer system somewhere on a server internal to, to the organization. Um, so in theory, a lot of times either you're scanning or you know, you're scanning a barcode. So you know each component part may tie back to a certain test result. Um, take the concept of an airbag and a, a pass or fail airbag check. Um, that level of traceability for such an important safety critical component, you can go back to a manufacturer and to their supplier and say, you know, this particular airbag, we had a malfunction, is, was, did it test proper? And you can go find that record. Well, a lot of times there are other tests that are just run, the data is aggregated, but not attributed necessarily to any individual particular vehicle or assembly. This way, you can do exactly that. You can use that space to combine and consolidate everything. And as each, each component is manufactured through the process, you could tag it back to a particular barcode or scan and have that information continue along the chain with that component. Or it is entirely possible, and a lot of the people in the autonomous vehicle space truly are hoping that data generated by the vehicle over time can be imported in and, and maintained with the vehicle, even though that would be something that would be after sale, um, that it could reside in a closed chain internal to the vehicle. Okay, awesome. And that really is something that, that someone like um, Mercedes uh, is looking into with Koopman Logistics. Um, it's really a traceability application, a, a part tracking system where they're trying to establish some of the basic performance metrics um, and monitoring of components as they cross international borders. Um, this kind of information is, is really, it's a logistics project, um, but currently um, Koopman and Mercedes-Benz are really happy about where they're at starting this project. And there's really some good PR out there for the efforts in just logistics management itself, you know, really kind of the tip of the iceberg and in, in the potential within the supply chain. Next slide, please. And digital data passports. I mean, really this, this goes to the, to the soup to nuts of collecting all of this information in the vehicle. Next slide. When you stop and think about how much data is being generated, particularly in connected vehicles these days, and it doesn't even have to be an autonomous vehicle. It can just be a, collect, a connected car that, that has the ability to bring signals in, send signals out. Um, when you look at this, again, an eye chart, um, but the data being collected ranges from what's what you're playing on your infotainment system to your tire pressure to uh, your GPS location, it's just a huge amount of data that's being collected, some of which is incredibly relevant and could be very beneficial uh, in a lot of different applications. Next slide, please. Some of those bits of information, really, if, if you collect them and, and aggregate them in a, into a single place, will give an owner, a vehicle owner, the ability to say, I've had all of this service work done. Imagine one comprehensive, truly a, a modernized version of, of the Carfax. Um, digital passport. Um, BMW has an application, Verify Car, which allows the tracing of odometers, um, tachographs, and, and different repair and replacements 
and accident information for that vehicle so you can truly verify your vehicle um, with a blockchain application. Likewise, Renault is working on car passport, which the same sort of information would be available to someone who wants to purchase um, a used vehicle um, that contains their technology. So this kind of um, user or purchaser oriented information could be really in invaluable if that is something that comes with your vehicle, it's packaged in your vehicle, and they don't have to rely on truly digging up these records with service shops and, and trying to have some external traceability when it's all documented in vehicle. Next slide, please. Uh, and that could include more than just kind of, I've taken my vehicle to the shop and I had this uh, recall repaired. It could, it could contain information from telematic systems, vehicle to vehicle discussions. Um, it, you could ultimately figure out what some of those basic safety messages going back and forth um, prior to an accident. You could take a look at how close you were to the vehicle in front of you. Um, but what's nice about it is, as, as Bill's mentioned and in past presentations they've talked about, is how secure this information is. Um, when you, there, there's a lot of worry about vehicle hacking. That's far more uh, of a pressing concern these days. Uh, and automakers are taking it very seriously. When you think about the data that would be put into this type of a system, blockchain is inherently more resilient. Um, it's cryptographically protected. You're not dealing with, with the risk of reverse engineering. A lot of benefits when you're talking about adding blockchain to protect vehicle data in a passport type application. Next slide. Jen, just a quick question because I'm, I'm really interested in the sort of protection angle. Um, I mean, candidly, you know, as a non-expert in this area, I don't think I recognize how much data is really being collected by the vehicle at all times. So, I mean, in a way, is blockchain just a way of sort of aggregating the data and making it more accessible and sort of shareable um, for what's already out there? I'm just sort of interested in your thoughts there because I don't know. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, you know, you, you want everything you've ever done in the vehicle to sort of be tracked, but I mean, maybe it already is, you tell me. Yes and no. I mean, there are, there are certain pockets of data that are being tracked, that are being recorded. I mean, when you think about it, all of us, for the most part, are driving vehicles around. Most vehicles have a black box. Um, but when you think about what the EDR, that, that event data recorder, is recording, it's only really recording a, a limited snippet of things. Right. So long term, what's actually being maintained and what's being saved, so to speak, it is somewhat limited. The vehicle generates just an amazing amount of data. And it's not like we would necessarily want every single piece of data that a vehicle generates um, collected. I mean, whether there's certain signals going on with certain torque values from certain components um, that may or may not be useful. Um, but at the same time, if there is a system that could have a, a more, I don't wanna say an unlimited ability to collect data, but you know, more so than our current black boxes and, and more so than trying to send it off site to a server, um, in, in which case I can tell you that the cost of just testing um, autonomous vehicles, just, just a small fleet, um, the, 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 the data cost can be in the millions to try to store the amount of data and information that, that is collected. So there's a plethora and a wealth of, of information to collect in the vehicle. And that's really where it's gonna come down to what information is important, what makes sense, and kind of more in, in your bailiwick and, and, and field, um, what's the importance of kind of the storage and, and the costs of the mining behind the scenes. And I'd love to get a little bit later your, your take on, on the trade-offs and, and whether there's a value in, in providing that information and keeping it accessible. And we can, we can debate that here in a little bit. Um, but I'll give you an example that really goes to the heart of kind of the question you asked. And uh, General Motors and Springs Lab, um, Spring Labs have a, a partnership right now where they're looking at, at $15 million to fund a project that would protect on the front end um, identity of individuals and, and preventing even fake applicants from trying to get a car loan. Uh, what they found is people are scraping data that they're finding, whether it's on the dark web or whether they're finding you know, other nefarious ways of kind of compiling human beings into an aggregate individual with different credit points and different data points. They've been very successful at using these 
quasi-fake identity as a synthetic identity to apply for and obtain a loan for a vehicle and thus defrauding the company later on. Well, using a blockchain approach um, with your own identity, trying to, to, to apply for a, a vehicle loan, um, they're finding that this is a really good way to try to, to defeat some of those uh, sneak thievery um, approaches. So just another interesting application that, uh, that uh, the vehicle manufacturers are interested in to try to protect um, both us as consumers and them as a sales point and a, a, a leasing and or um, you know, vehicle manufacturer in general. Next slide, please. So finally kind of going on to the, the notion of a use case that, that I've mentioned throughout. And it's one that I'm kind of most excited about at least from a vehicle safety perspective and that's recall and warranty management. Next slide. So let's talk about spinach and airbags. Um, what does spinach have to do with the automotive industry? Really probably nothing, but along within the last couple of years, uh, we've heard more and more about you know, tainted lettuce, tainted spinach, um, a lot of problems in the food industry and supply chain. And we've heard about the ability to trace lots. And when you look at, at some of the recalls that you see in grocery stores for vegetables, um, they're very broad. And a lot of days uh, worth of produce are, are recalled and, and it may be something for an entire month or, or multiple weeks. So you're losing a lot of, of you know, you're, you're, you're losing a lot of product, you're having to re replace a lot of product or give refunds on a lot of product. And it really, it, it's impactful. And in the very early days of why, what, why don't we use blockchain more frequently, the hypothetical was thrown out, what if we could apply blockchain for traceability purposes in say spinach, lettuce and, and produce that has a lot of issues um, with respect to recall, salmonella and other things. So a lot of brains got together and started to think about the traceability aspects. That weaved over and when you stop and think about a lot of the, the recalls in recent years in the automotive realm, um, there, there are obviously a couple that are going to come to mind and some of the challenges that the OEMs themselves and the suppliers faced was getting enough product, identifying which product are really bad and need to be replaced and in what precedential order, and those problems can, can either be assisted through a blockchain, or at least they can, they can kind of improve the application of performing recalls and warranty repairs. Next slide, please. And how do they do that? It allows the manufacturer to go through, and if you truly know that a production machine uh, created bad parts, you now have the ability to tie down to that very tight component time frame. You can, trace a, you, know, you can trace through for specific VIN numbers that might have those particularly individualized components that are impacted. You can verify once a component's been replaced. If later we find this, we have in some recalls in the last five years that the recalled component themselves didn't fix the recall, it's easy to trace who received those parts and when to insert them in the recall process. Um, for those of you who know conflict mineral regulations, the 3GT um, compliance, it's, it's something the blockchain application, the traceability can take you all the way back to figure out what mine your materials came from, um, where, where the entire supply chain flows. So you'll know if there's a, a um, conflict minerals issue in the component just by knowing the blockchain and the whole, the whole process. Um, we talked about the counterfeit part pro, um, problem. When you look at it, the estimates are that it's a $45 billion issue in the in, in, in global economy. When you think about tackling 45 billion, if you could get a blockchain to try to prevent or, or um, tamp down on that, that's significant cost saved to the industry as a whole. And likewise, targeting costs can help reduce that $22 billion recall arena. Next slide. So from that standpoint, when you look at the use cases, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting area. There's a lot of challenges in getting there, but um, it, it really holds some great solutions to longstanding problems, many of which include the traceability notion, the ability to, to weed down and narrow safety recalls, to, to narrow warranty claims that will really be a boon to the industry. 
And with that, um, you know, I'd like to transition to, you know, sort of a couple questions I have for Jen. And we were joking before the presentation got started about how the questions falls under my name and the answers falls under Jen's name, because I think that's mostly how this is going to go. Um, because like I said, and it's obvious, you know, she's a pro in this area and I would like to learn a bit more. So Jen, I mean, you've talked about big companies, you know, BMW, um, you know, among others. And I would be curious for your thoughts on how accessible this technology really is to smaller businesses, right? Suppliers, you know, Michigan run businesses, things like that, um, who might be interested in getting into this, but, you know, again, might not have tens or 20, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars dedicated to an exploratory research project. I think there there is some level of accessibility. It's, it isn't something that truly is going to require a $15 million investment. When you think about some of those projects and, and the GM project, particularly the, the loan, um, kind of the, the identity crisis and, and kind of protecting against synthetic identities, that, pro, uh, that project as an example was a $15 million project. Um, the scope of that is so large that they truly wanted to, to make major investments and have something that would potentially be a ready application that they would launch internally. When, it, when you come down to, to smaller suppliers, whether it's a tier one or even further down the supply chain into the lower tiers, it's not unaccessible. I mean, it's, it's something that there are startups that are pursuing the idea of, of blockchain as an application it's definitely worth, you know, meeting some of these companies, getting out there and understanding what they're doing, because not everyone is really, it, it, it is accessible outside the $15 million price tag. I, I think that's really the answer. Yeah, and I mean, it strikes me as, you know, notwithstanding the cost and the setup fees, right? I mean, there's a real opportunity here, one for cost savings, efficiency gains, right? Um, you know, there was a time in which having an app on a mobile phone was thought of something that you know, only the biggest companies could do. But then, you know, sort of the technologies there, the developers are out there where it's really it's ubiquitous. Not, yeah, exactly. Like everybody's got an app now. Do you think blockchain is going to go that way? Do you think we're going to see this technology continue to sort of seep into the industry such that it's, it's commonplace? Well, I, I think that we can see from the from from kind of the the interesting applications and the interesting use cases um, that are even outside of automotive. I, I think it's becoming more and more a, a totally viable, um, you know, a total totally viable avenue. And I think we can see that. And and I'm going to pose one back at you um, that you and I can talk uh, about. People are are jumping into other areas with blockchain as a concept. I mean, are, are yours and my favorite things in the world, non-fungible tokens. Um, for those of you who don't, who've heard the, the new buzzword NFTs, um, it's, it's, it's interesting because there are other uses for this type of model that are just becoming imminently popular in the music space, in the art space. Um, I, I think, was it Wall Street Journal or, or one of the, um, one of the major papers may have been New York Times, spent a truckload of money to buy a digital image of a Siamese cat. Um, and and again, it, it's using this model of ownership. So you're seeing new and crazy applications on a daily basis. So I think, you know, in, in answer to your question, it's, gonna, it's going to be more and more accessible. It's so accessible that you could jump on the, the new social media platform Clubhouse and nonstop find somebody talking about blockchain. You know, I think that's just a clear example of how it's, it's, it too will shortly be ubiquitous. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's, it's obviously a really exciting time to be in this space, not just for, you know, lawyers, right, to, to think about the regulations, but I mean, for businesses, there are new applications of this technology that you're discussing, new ways of thinking about you know, how we go and we market ourselves and what do we do to, you know, get people in the door for our business um, that had never really been thought of before. And the technology is sort of growing and evolving with that. And you're seeing new applications or not necessarily, you know, brand new, but I mean, the NFT thing is a good example of something which, you know, is really not a huge leap forward from the technology that was always there, or has been there for a while, but a new way of using it. And I think that's what's really exciting about this. I mean, there's just 
so many different applications for blockchain in different industries. I mean, past presentations, we've talked about anything, right? I mean, you know, COVID vaccines, you know, creating blockchain records regarding, you know, the temperature they were stored in, you know, tracking, you know, spinach, I mean, grocery stores using blockchain to handle, you know, extremely complex, you know, requirements around food handling, ordering, you know, turnover with expiration dates, any sort of example or any sort of industry you can think of, I think really is going to, you know, be well, be do well to start exploring how this stuff could be used. So I think it's really exciting. Um, well, looking at that, I mean, we, we do, we are talking about some traditional uses within the automotive space as well. And, and as, as you've talked about in past presentations, the, the, the fundamental root of a lot of this was kind of a payment transaction system mm -hmm. and, and dealing with that, that financing end. Um, I, I see that our friends at uh, PayPal are beefing up their crypto payment system. Right. Um, I think that was big on the news this morning. Let me ask you this. Do you, first off, I mean, there's a lot of applications in automotive that can help from raw materials all the way through the system into the final vehicle and, and even the transaction and sale to, to the, the purchaser of the vehicle, the user of the vehicle, um, or, you know, the different ride shares and mobility. But do you see even cryptocurrency becoming a, a part of the automotive supply chain? Do you see more companies paying in a cryptocurrency um, for, for goods or even for services? Yeah, I mean, I really do. I, I think, you know, listen, the fact of the matter is, I mean, folks are exploring digital assets because it offers speed, efficiency, you know, verification, audit trail, all sorts of things, which, you know, if you think of digital assets as a new form of money, um, and a new form of exchanging or perhaps storing value that, you know, there's, there's a lot of inefficiencies built into the system. I mean, some of them are self-imposed and make good sense for policy reasons, right? We want people to verify the transactions aren't being used for bad activities, but at the same time, I mean, there's a real business case there and you're sort of seeing early adopters, um, you know, Tesla's, you know, always sort of tossed around for one reason or another, but I mean, you know, Tesla has made waves here for a lot of reasons. One, you know, first they announced that they were holding um, Bitcoin as part of their treasury reserve assets, right? And that's that's a real strong statement as to what people think about the long-term use case and value of digital assets, right? I mean, it's essentially saying, we think that Bitcoin is going to be a better treasury store than cash or other sort of forms of traditional assets. And in the same way, Tesla kind of went and was a bit of a pioneer, at least in accepting Bitcoin for actual transactions and payments for their vehicles. I mean, one Bitcoin right now is about $63,000. Um, and it's, it's funny sort of giving these webinars and every, every week the, the dollar value keeps going up. So we'll see how long this lasts. But I mean, I'll get you a really nice, you know, Model Y or Model 3 or, you know, whatever, uh, three tires on your Model S or something like that. So you know, that also is sort of a view that, you know, Tesla's looking at digital assets as a long-term in value, as something that is appealing and of interest for their customers. Maybe their customers keep their wealth or their assets in digital assets or Bitcoin. Maybe that's how they want to go and save money. Um, but, you know, whether it's as a long-term store of value, whether it's facilitating, you know, customer transactions, or whether it's, you know, just adding efficiency to transactions between businesses, partners, suppliers. I think there's a real use case here that is worth exploring. And I think we're gonna keep seeing this payment processor narrative continue. I mean, PayPal at its core is a payment processor. And to be clear, you know, there's, there's money service businesses regulations that I discussed a little bit in my last week's webinar. Um, this is not something that people should do sort of um, without professional guidance, um, quick plug there for, for myself, but it's, you know, it's an area that has tremendous business potential. So I think folks are going to take that, that leap and yeah, it's going to go and sort of maybe change the way we think about doing, doing business. I mean, maybe in the future it's, you know, whether it's Apple pay or sending, you know, a Bitcoin or something like that, maybe that's how we pay for vehicles in the future. Who knows? It wouldn't be shocking. Well, and you were talking earlier and you'd asked the question, that's kind of pivoting just a little bit. You were asking the question about, you know, how much data is in the vehicle 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, is it a value to collect everything? Um, going to the back end, since kind of you, you know a little bit more about the back end than most people, um, and you, you understand the implications of, of kind of the, I don't know, call it the dirty underbelly of, of, of uh, mining. Um, what do you see for the future of mining? in terms of how much of a challenge it is if we do use these types of applications, if we do truly protect the supply chain from kind of, you know, take the spinach example from start to finish or take an automotive component from the raw material if there's something with tungsten in it that comes out of a mine in, um, in the Congo, you're monitoring it all the way through the supply chain all the way to the end. How, I don't wanna say literally expensive, but how digitally expensive is it to try to put that sort of a traceability system in play? And what do you think the downsides are, Bill, of, of, of a heavy adoption of this in the automotive sector? Yeah, I mean, you know, without getting on a little soapbox here, I, th I think there's been a lot of discussion recently about energy consumption of Bitcoin, you know, among others. And, you know, listen, Bitcoin was designed to use proof of work, which was intended to be costly and hard to do. Um, as a way of securing the blockchain. But you have to understand, I mean, Bitcoin was the first through the door. And I'm not saying that other technologies are superior um, or, you know, offer, you know, a better investment proposition than Bitcoin or whatever. But I will say that, you know, things like proof of stake, um, other sort of methods of verification and approaches that different digital assets have used, different blockchains have used to verify their transactions are not nearly as costly or as energy consuming. Um, as a general proposition, I think the energy consumption of Bitcoin is a bit blown out of proportion. Um, it's an easy sort of, you know, straw man argument for folks to go and, and um, you know, use to criticize Bitcoin. But, you know, you can have a lot of different variations of the underlying tech. I mean, just because, you know, Bitcoin was the equivalent of, you know, whatever, the, you know, the gold coin being, um, you know, used in the Roman Empire or something like that. Subsequent forms of money have become more scalable, right? Easier to move, easier to print, you know, fungible, things that um, make it, you know, more efficient and more better suited to business applications. And if you look at Bitcoin and digital assets in that, that sort of evolving way, um, you know, I think that we'll see business blockchain applications find ways of, of becoming more energy efficient. And they already are pretty energy efficient, I believe. So, you know, I think like anything, we're, we're sort of in the infancy of this. Um, you know, folks are asking these questions for the first time, but I'm very, very hopeful for where it's gonna go. I don't think it's gonna be an issue. Well, and, and taking that on just from my, my vantage point, um, it's, it's interesting to think of how much data there is that could be collected. And I mean, when you think about what it really takes to, to manufacture a vehicle from start to finish, um, or once you own a vehicle, how much data is being generated every moment that you drive that vehicle. I think there needs to be really a lot of thought put into the process of if we do keep something, if we do truly add something to a chain that's truly traceable, you know, what is it that we're doing? Why are we doing it? And really, you know, don't just throw spaghetti at the wall and make every, try to make everything stick, but have a targeted approach that you know, interestingly enough, it's not as if the regulators are truly looking into this space in a blockchain, you know, from drafting anything regulatory, um, that blockchain shall be used to collect certain bits of information. But if you look historically at their approaches to EDRs, the, the black boxes in your vehicles, the event data recorders, mm -hmm. um, that is something that could be of, an in, of interest ultimately to a regulatory body as to what is collected and what's maintained over time. Because I'll tell you, in conversations with some of the safety experts in the Office of Defects Investigation that I've had over the years, there is a fundamental lack of visibility for people at NHTSA who are investigating accidents in the data that led up to the, to the vehicle accident itself. Um, really, it's something that, that the supply base might get from the original equipment manufacturer, the, the, the car company. It's something that the car company has in whatever capacity it has based on what the vehicle may have collected, you know, but the regulators rarely see it. So it, this could be potential, uh, potentially an interesting area for um, regulatory action in the next, say, 10 years. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, 
you know, you imagine, I always sort of think about how much more complicated cars are getting, right? I mean, good and bad. I mean, in many ways going on increasing safety, but I mean, you have, you know, lane keeping mechanisms, you have, you know, radar based, um, I'm not going to get into sort of the autonomous vehicle, you know, uh, idea, but I mean, just basic technology, things will stop your car if they think you're going to hit an object. These things have to be generating massive amounts of data. And I mean, I would imagine um, that it's just got to be a regulatory nightmare to try to track that, try to interpret it, try to go and, you know, use different applications and different sort of storing mechanisms that are used by these different manufacturers, aggregate it, and then use it to address, you know, issues that are a matter of public safety. I'd also- Even if they have access to it. Oh yeah, right? I mean, if you could go and pull out a blockchain and say, hey, you know, you push a button and, you know, it spits out a little computer chip out of the, you know, under the infotainment system and that's the car's blockchain. I mean, that would be revolutionary, good and for bad, right? I mean, there's privacy concerns there, but, you know, it's interesting from a policy perspective, I'm interested in your thoughts. I mean, I'm, I've loved cars my whole life, um, but I see in whether this is real or perceived that there's a lot of public policy questions that are sort of coming to the forefront as well about vehicles, right? You know, what do we do with the fact that they sit idle so much of the time? Should I really buy a car when I can just use one and Uber and Lyft to sort of push this as well as ride share um, platforms from, you know, anywhere from Porsche to, you know, some other manufacturers have explored this Cadillac, I think is another one of them. Um, you know, what do we do? What do we use a vehicle for? Do we really need one? Can you imagine the blockchain going and helping actually bolster the need um, for a vehicle and the consumption of vehicles as a product? I, I can. And and it's interesting because, you know, you, you did mention kind of Cadillac and, and GM had its Maven program. And what we found is that there's a, a mix in terms of adoption and, and who is willing to use these types of share technologies and how successful they are and the reasons that they may not be so mm -hmm. successful. And in terms of ride share, mobility share, and really kind of the future vision of mobility to try to increase the uptime of vehicle usage, I think this is absolutely critical because you're going to want in that type of a system, you're going to want to understand the usage of a vehicle, who's driving, when they're driving, making payment transactions a little bit easier um, to, to be able to kind of even complete the contract. If you have, for example, an apartment building that has a shared vehicle, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the concept of some of those was to park in a, a building in an urban setting, a vehicle that anyone could use, um, kind of the zip car or Maven model. Sure. When you think about that application and you have different people wanting to hop in and use it, you have your ownership and, and, and the vehicle may be owned by the apartment, it may be owned by a fleet manager somewhere, but you'll have people coming in, they'll, they'll wand in, chip in, or however they get into the vehicle, make their reservations, get the vehicle, take it for a ride, um, go grocery shopping, do whatever that they, they need to do. But there are so many things that could be traced with that that really would make it successful because some of the problems of, of a shared mobility service are, are un unbelievably simple in the sense of what happens if someone gets into an accident? What happens if someone leaves the vehicle in a bad position and doesn't clean it? You know, what if somebody takes it out on a night on the town and, and messes up the interior? Mm -hmm. um, things like that, as, as simple as those problems are, they make rideshare more difficult. Uh, and even in COVID, where you need someone to come in and do a, a thorough cleaning before that vehicle is taken by another party out, and it's, it provides some traceability in terms of who has the vehicle, what their payment parameters are, what their usage is, and, and it really could help, if nothing else, build a case to whether we want to truly move into that, into a, a more rideshare based economy or, or stay with some sort of a hybrid model. I mean, it seems to me too, when you're talking about rideshare applications, I mean, I moved to, um, to Ann Arbor from Chicago and I, I briefly, you know, would use car to go, notwithstanding the fact that, you know, we had a car that we owned because it was just useful. I mean, right, there'd be one sitting there, you could hop in it, you could drive it to where you needed to go and you could leave it there. Fleet management, I would imagine there are some really amazing applications here because things like making sure your fleet of, you know, whatever, large commercial vehicles had adequate tire pressure. I mean, that's a small detail that has really big impacts. One is matter of safety, but two, I mean, on 
bottom line dollars and cents, right? I mean, you have underinflated tires, you're, you're going to see a pretty big net effect at the end of the day as to, you know, the cost of running those vehicles. Do you see sort of fleet applications and commercial applications being another avenue for this? Absolutely. And, and what's, what's interesting in the fleet arena is it actually hits on more issues and, and more almost kind of legal issues when you stop and think about what can be traced, what can be tracked, and what can be improved and optimized. Um, obviously, if you're talking about long haul trucking or you're talking about other types of, of fleet movement um, and employee slash um, contract drivers, you have all of the regulations that those drivers need to abide by um, from a standpoint of, of just their ability to make sure they're properly licensed, to make sure that they're getting their appropriate rest breaks, that they're only driving so many miles per trip. I mean, even those types of things could be more consolidatedly tracked um, and, and long-term give you more visibility into what's going on with your workforce from that standpoint. You know, you also do have the, the notion of, I have someone with, you know, we're, we're tracking the tire pressure, we're tracking what roads they're on, so a geolocation um, where if you get a lot of other inputs that can come into the system, you may be able to cross-tab um, road conditions, environmental conditions, vehicle conditions, and truly understand and optimize your fleet routes uh, in a more real-time basis based on, you know, the, the accuracy of collection and even the availability of information to other fleet operators. For example, vehicles um, with sensor technology, you can get kind of a read of the roughness of the road. If a fleet operator is collecting that information, actually looking at that information and it, it's maintained, um, they could do a more real-time um, route alteration to try to either save on the vehicle fleet's wear and tear or deal with other, you know, other emerging issues in a transit route um, in closer to real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, mean, I think it's some great points you make. I mean, it's interesting too, you, you had touched just briefly then about, you know, environment, right? And again, taking it back to sort of policy position, I mean, Again, I, I love cars. I would love to think that, you know, we're going to have very analog, you know, fun to drive cars our whole life. But I mean, as the automotive industry continues to shift, right, and society's need for vehicles changes. And, you know, of course, it's looked different 50 years ago than it does today and has a will look in 50 years. I think there's some great opportunities here to sort of bring the automotive industry in line with what society's need for automobiles is. One use case that popped into mind was, or come to mind was, I know Ford had gone and explored blockchain application where they were taking hybrid plug-in vehicles and using geofencing to monitor basically a vehicle emissions and air quality in city centers. Now in a city center that has, you know, very strong environmental restrictions or is very concerned with that, they were able to monitor, all right, we have this many vehicles moving these ways, you know, at this time of day when the temperature is this and the sun is like that, and this is what the air quality is like. Um, I see this really as a, a huge area of expansion and growth and, and something that could really help businesses and, and automotive uh, manufacturers confront things like, how are we gonna become carbon neutral if that's a priority? How are we going to go and, you know, use vehicles to, to do what people really need them to do, which might be very different, like I said, you know, 20 years from now than it is right now. It's a great use case for the need for a true public-private partnership, actually, when, yeah. when you mention it like that. Um, think of all the things, and I think you've, you've just forecast a, a, a nice way that we can improve on, you know, kind of some major climate related problems. At the same time, when you think about it, most people uh, in, in a regulatory capacity, whether it's um, at a state or local level, or you're talking about Congress, the biggest thing in their mind with respect to this arena is how do we regulate the case of Bitcoin going nuts? And, and that's where, where their attention is focused. If we could do a little more to educate our, our, our you know, regulatory bodies, our local governments, our state governments, and our federal government, as to these applications, this really truly could be a great um, public-private partnership that could help a major city, 
um, decrease their emission, you know, emissions issues and, and improve the climate literally and figuratively in the area. But just understanding that this is this a kissing cousin, so to speak, to the idea of, of Bitcoin and, and other things that you want to heavily regulate. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's look at the good applications. Let's look at how this can help mobility. Let's look at how this can help um, climate. Let's look at all the different applications and do it and do it right this time. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's true. And it's a great way of sort of synthesizing it. I mean, say you're studying, you know, the environmental impact, right? You have, you have both the information that can go to the government, you have the information that can go to the auto, you know, manufacturer to improve their technology, their vehicles. But I mean, also scientists, I mean, also researchers, folks, you know, who are going to go and try to work to, you know, solve society's problems. I just think this is an immense, you know, source of data and information that could go and move these things along. And I mean, you know, on the financial regulatory side, again, you can you can view the other webinar if you want my thoughts there, but I agree with you entirely. Like the educational component of this is huge. Um, and I know at least with regard to, you know, digital assets and cryptographic based applications that there's a strong, you know, lobbying campaign and education campaign that we're sort of seeing taking place in Washington and I wouldn't be surprised if that spilled over to other blockchain applications, um, because really there's there's a huge, huge opportunity there, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, whether whether it's in that arena, whether we're talking about something that truly has ha has a greater security focus in these really uncertain cyber times. I know you guys have had presentations that have covered that as well. Um, I mean, it's 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 just a, a, an interesting tool. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, it's a hammer. It needs a nail. We, we yeah. can't just go hitting everything, but it's really, it, it, there are going to be some amazing use cases and blockchain is going to be there. I, I'll prognosticate a little bit. Um, we've been talking about blockchain and auto probably for the last five or six years at a good reasonable clip. I would be very surprised if five years from now, you know, Bill, you and I are going to be on a webinar just like this saying, see, we told you so. Um, it's, it's coming, get comfortable with it. Think about its applications. And I, I, I seriously think educating yourself, educating your team and really considering and contemplating how we can educate and create that public private partnership. It's going to be important, particularly in our sector. So we can use this as a tool for traceability. So we can use this to mitigate recall and warranty costs. Mm -hmm. So we can use this for better transactions internal to our own supply chain. And so we can use it as a fraud prevention um, and possibly even fake component, counterfeit component prevention tool. I think the opportunity to save the industry um, a lot of money and to reduce and mitigate a lot of problems is just amazing going forward. And that's where I see us in the next five years. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of wrap up our discussion on that note. I mean, you know, listen, there was a time in which the internet was, you know, very much sort of this, this thing that only computer science PhDs understood. And eventually it sort of came to the forefront in a way that folks could, you know, interact with it. And, you know, you didn't have to learn hypertext mapping language. And, you know, you could see, you know, a search engine, even if there was some, some, somebody on the other side of the computer, they're populating those lists manually. And, you know, that really wasn't that long ago. I mean, I remember you know, the first time I saw Google you know, back in the early 2000s. And we're like, oh, well, is it going to be Google? Or is it going to be Yahoo? And like, in you know, all these other competing you know, agencies and Google's now Google, right? Um, and all these businesses, whether it was Amazon, it was like, who wants to buy books online? I mean, it's, you're going to see that certain businesses are going to take this tech and really run with it, I think. And I mean, I, I would be hopeful, and I think you're going to be right, Jen, that we're going to see this tech um, for a while. And I think folks are looking to you know, use it for any manner of reasons, any number of reasons. And I'm excited for it. I think it's a really cool opportunity. I think just like internet back in the 2000s, if you're paying attention now, if you're sitting on webinars, if you're trying to learn, you know, you're an early adopter. So good on you. Um, with that, Jen, I, I think we've gotten to about the end of our hour. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure um, talking with you. 
really, um, I, I think the audience has gone and taken a whole lot away from your discussion and our contact information is there. Um, please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to either Jen or, you know, if there's if you think there's something I can help you with though, Jen is obviously the pro here with the automotive industry and emerging tech. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out um, because we'd love to help uh, help you through this and, you know, get your feet underneath you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, everyone who attended. Uh, just a reminder, we'll put a copy of this recording up on the Butzel.com website, along with a copy of the slides. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, presenters. Thank you, attendees. And have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.